He is the pocket square professor, and you'll learn all about the cloud. So listen as he teaches technology. He is the pocket square professor. All right, everyone. Welcome to our next section. In this one here, we are actually going to start uh, the first of our applications that we're going to be going over in this course. And we're going to be talking about email. Email is something we should all be pretty familiar with, of course, but to understand how it works here in the modern workspace, we're going to kind of dive into that. But what we're going to talk about here first in this particular lecture uh, is the fundamentals. How does email work? Uh, how does the simple message uh, transfer protocol work, uh, simple mail transfer protocol message, I guess either or works, but uh, which the SMTP protocol is what we're going to be looking at. So how does that work uh, and where does exchange fit into this? So this is what we're going to be looking at here today. So let's jump right in. All right, so email fundamentals as a whole, we have to start off with SMTP. This is what drives it, the simple mail transfer protocol. Uh, obviously, message could certainly could be in there too, but we're really looking at email here. So I think we all know what email is, where it's the internet standard for electronic mail transfer. How, how are we doing this and why do we do it? Well, we're going to dive into that as we go through here. Uh, but for the scope of this discussion here, uh, just know that the SMTP is the internet standard for electronic mail transfer. Now, when we're looking at this again as a whole, primarily, uh, I say primarily, port 25 is utilized. That is SMTP port. Uh, that is what it is attached to. However, we do have other ports that we could potentially use. One of which is 587, which is a client submission port uh, that's generally used in MTAs or mail transfer agents, uh, but still could certainly be used. And I've also seen this one quite a lot, port 2525. Uh, this is something that certainly could be used, uh, but uh, it's just another option. But primarily we're looking at port 25 here. Uh, now, just a common piece and a common sense of uh, just understanding. This is one, just one, of many of the differences when we're looking at, uh, we all, obviously, you're watching this here, you're on some sort of internet service provider. Uh, our internet service providers, we have different levels of our providers that we get, uh, the different subscriptions that we have, if you will. So generally speaking, we have residential, uh, but then we also have business and such. So one of the big factors that comes into play here is by default on all residential, and this is pretty standard across the board. Now, I can't speak on every internet service provider, but on most of them, by default, port 25 outbound is going to be blocked. That's where they block it at the ISP level, so they just don't allow it. Uh, and the reason why they do that is because of security reasons. It is very easy to uh, become infected with some sort of malware or something and turn your computer into something that's spamming out. Uh, so if we block port 25 at the ISP level, uh, they are essentially blocking that uh, kind of functionality from happening, of course. So always something that we want to be aware of uh, in a business. This is the difference between business versus residential. Just one small difference. There's lots of others, of course. Uh, but that port 25 is generally not available on the residential side, whereas it is available or all ports are available uh, in the a business side and it's up to you as the organization to manage this uh, whether it be through some sort of firewall or uh, again proxy whatever it is don't worry about that just know that it is up to you to essentially secure that all right let's jump into simple mail transfer protocol i don't want to dive into the deep we're actually going to look at some submissions and what it actually looks like but let's break it down here a little bit further now we've looked at this already a little bit in the dns section when we talked about the email address uh, when we look at DNS, the way that an email address is like a telephone number. All right, so when we dial a number, it gets to somebody. When we type in a email address, it gets delivered to somebody. So, I mean, that's, that makes sense. We, this should not be necessarily groundbreaking to you. But how we do it here, this is where we break it up. Because there's a very specific way in which we have this email address divided. So the first section we always read here is on the right, where in this instance here, I've given you my example of what my email address is for the lab environment. That is the SMTP domain. That is what our email provider, or our, we'll call it server here, this, just keep it at this level, our email server, when we send an email out, the 
SMTP domain is what is used for when uh, we need to make a connection to another server. So we use this SMTP uh, domain to say, okay, well, hey, I'm a server. I got an email that is destined for pocketsquareprofessor.live. Great. Uh, I'm going to go out to the public internet. I'm going to find that MX record, which is a mail exchanger record. And whatever that points me to, I'm going to establish that connection. Then once it's established that connection, Oops, didn't mean to go that way. I meant to go this way. Once it establishes that connection, we look at recipient. And if you see here, we have an email alias. And this email alias is essentially going to be that person. This is a unique attribute. Only one M. Alloway, a pocket square professor dot live can exist in the world. If we have two, what ends up happening is that we can really, well, we could get very confused or make our email servers very confused. But in theory, we could deliver to two mailboxes at the same time. That is where we something called a distribution list. We'll get into that when we talk about the mail routing. But for now, this particular user is my account. I have an email address uh, of mlaway at pocketsquareprofessor.live. So what we do here is the computer, and this is the very first thing that the server looks for, is this at sign, because this is a delimiter. And it says everything to the right of it is going to be the SMTP domain. Everything to the left of it is going to be the email alias. So when Exchange Server here, which we're going to be talking about, uh, when Exchange gets a piece of mail, it's going to break it down based off of this and deliver it accordingly. If we make a typo somewhere or uh, if we fat finger, that happens more frequently than you uh, than we all care to admit, of course. Uh, but, you know, when we accidentally send an email to the wrong address, you know, in this instance here, like, uh, you know, we did pockets professor dot, I don't know something else not live uh, I, I don't have any other domains I do have dot com uh, but maybe if you sent it to dot net I don't know that domain uh, is owned by somebody else that may potentially go over there uh, but what ends up happening is that the responding server you're gonna get a couple of responses the first one here in this instance if we can't find that SMTP domain doesn't exist I can't send it anywhere you're gonna get something called an NDR which is a non deliverable report and that NDR will tell you hey this isn't going to work. We can't send it out. The other one is if we spelled the recipient's name wrong, the email address alias here over there on the left. We spell that wrong. Okay. Well, <clears throat> again, we're going to get a response saying, hey, this person doesn't exist. They don't, they're not here. Try someone else. NDRs are important. We'll talk a little bit more about those when we get to uh, the uh, defense, if you will, or the hygiene section. Uh, so we're just going to say at a high level, this is how email flow works. Now let's look at it. I have a little diagram here and it's actually pretty simple. Okay, so when we're looking at email, the way it flows is that we have our sender. Again, I am on a computer and I am accessing. And in this instance here, we're going to leave out exchange, client access, all of that we're going to leave off to the side. Emails never, ever, ever, so again, I have my sender here, they never originate from the sender. We are actually using a client access service to get to an email server. So in this instance here, I'm on my computer and I type in a, an email. Okay, let's just say I'm in Outlook or I'm in Gmail, Yahoo, whatever. I'm logging into their servers and I'm sending from their servers. That's what the client access role does. Now in this instance here, we have the sender is taking, oh, hey, I want to type into matt at uh, matt.com. The email server says, okay, well, I'm going to go out to the internet. And I'm going to find and resolve the MX record for Matt.com. Then I'm going to make a connection. Once I resolve it, I'm going to connect directly to that email server and say, hey, email server, I have an email destined for Matt at Matt.com. That email server is going to say, okay, all good. Uh, I'll deliver it for you. Or there's nobody here by that name. If there is somebody here by that name, it will be delivered to their mailbox which exists inside of the email server, not on the recipient. Okay, so the recipient and the sender, those are client access pieces. They are important, of course, because that's where essentially users and people were to send email from, but the ones that are actually doing the brunt of the work are the email servers on the back ends. We'll look at those when we look at mail flow as well as uh, on the other side, their client access. So, Let's continue on and dive a little bit further into this. Now, I pulled this right from Wikipedia. All right, so this is a great one here, and I just picked it because it was nice. Uh, but 
if we have an, a submission, all right, so we're looking at an email and we're sending it to, so when that server is trying to send over to the recipient server, what it's going to do, and we're going to break this down here. So we receive a 220, which is a uh, response. So it's saying that, okay, we're able to make a connection. Then we have a hello, H-E-L-O, uh, relay.example.org. So it's basically saying, hello, I, and then the research, and you can see that the sending server is the black and the recipient server is the blue. And in this instance here, you can see where it says S and C here. So, and there you go. So we're saying, all right, hello, uh, glad to meet you. And basically this is kind of actually exactly how these work. Uh, if we were to do a Telnet session, uh, what we can do here is we'll see it is that hello, relay, for example, dot com. I'm glad to meet you. So I have a mail from Bob at example dot org. OK, looks good. I have a recipient to Alice at example dot org recipient to the boss at example dot com. So in this instance here, we have an email from Bob at example dot org sending to Alice at example dot com and the boss at example dot com. So again, we're sending to two recipients. So we have Alice and the boss. So we get a 250 OK. So it says, all right, both of those are recipients. We're good. Then we say, all right, I'm going to send you the data. Here's the data. And then you can see right here is where the response is. Uh, this is basically saying uh, we can use uh, control or basically control escape keys as needed uh, and do different syntax from it. So the way this works out is this entire section right here. This is the email. And this all looks pretty familiar. It's from Bob example at Bob example, Bob, excuse me, Bob example, Bob at example dot org to Alice, uh, Alice example at, from Alice example dot com. And we also see seeing or carbon copying the boss at example dot com. We have a date, which is the timestamp subject. So a subject line. Hey, this is a test message. We do a space here in between. We say, hello, Alice. Next line. This is a test message with five header fields, four lines in the message body. Your friend. Next line, Bob. And then the final line is this dot. Now, this dot is actually submit for uh, where this is a exit character. But it's basically, OK, we're done. We're going to submit this now. And you can see it's submit for queued. So it is queued right now as one, two, three, four, five, which is whatever email it certainly is currently in the queue on the recipient server. Then we quit, makes a connection that says goodbye. So we get the 221 and they both sever the connection. So this is how email works. This is the actual submission of the email. And this is through, uh, we can view these through Telnet. They are very, uh, we'll say complicated to work with. Uh, you have to be very precise with your typing uh, because backspace doesn't work out too well in a lot of these scenarios and it's very easy to misspell things. Uh, so again, this instance here is we certainly can do different things. Uh, now just showing you the way that this works out here is that hopefully just looking at this here, we do have the ability to, well, do bad things with this as well. So I can say, here's my mail from, and this could say Bill Gates and Microsoft.com. And the recipient is to, you know, Alice and the boss. And we're saying, hey, this is Bill Gates. Uh, you need to, uh, you're, you've been, we've determined that your computer is infected and click here on this link. So again, think about the bad things that we could do with it. That's why we need to really understand hygiene, which we have a whole section around it. So looking at everything that is in this particular submission here, there's a lot. But like I said, I just picked this directly from uh, Wikipedia here, which, of course, uh, the, the, you'll have reference for it as well. But looking at all of the pieces of it, this is just a very simple one. And this doesn't matter from Exchange or Gmail or whatever it is. They all work in this manner. It doesn't it doesn't. We're not talking just Microsoft unique here. So <clears throat> now let's change the conversation here is that when we're talking unique based off of how submission works and how emails go back and forth to each other, that's fine. But when we're looking at Microsoft Exchange inside of Microsoft's cloud platform. Uh, what is it? What is Microsoft Exchange? Now, Exchange is a productivity and communication tool. Productivity and communication tool. It's not just an email sending platform. We'll look at this here as we examine the client access side, uh, and especially around calendaring, tasks, contacts. Uh, there's a lot more than just email that it does. However, the Exchange piece is the back end. Users 
will interact with it via front ends. And there's lots of different front ends, but that's what we call that's what we call the client access role. Uh, in that particular instance, there can be the Outlook desktop client, could be the Outlook mobile client, it could be Active Sync, the native Active Sync mobile client, it could be Outlook on the web or, or Outlook web app, whichever. Uh, those are interchangeable nowadays. Uh, it has been rebranded as officially as Outlook on the web, but it could be any of those. So when we access it, we want to be able to send emails. So again, going back to what we saw here is that imagine if we had to send emails and we had to type all this stuff out. Well, email would have never caught on. So that's why we have user interfaces that they use. The servers are the one that translates it all into this, and then the servers are the ones that send it out. Currently, there are two stable versions of Exchange. Uh, the highest version is Exchange Server 2019. Uh, Exchange Server 2016 is still supported and still out there and is actually still recommended in certain instances. We'll talk about that when we get to the hybrid section. Uh, but Exchange Server 2019 is the standard right now. There's a lot going on with Exchange Servers. These are on-premise versions of Exchange. We are going to talk a tiny bit about Exchange on-premise. However, that is not the focus here. Remember, this is a modern network. This is collaborative functions inside of the cloud. So what we're going to be dealing with a lot, especially in our labs, is going to be Exchange Online. Now, just to give you, and I don't want to burst your bubble here, but uh, Exchange Online really is just Exchange Server 2019 in the cloud. Yes, there are, we'll say differences, of course, but at the end of the day, under the covers, it's still very much Exchange Server 2019 uh, or it's just Exchange Server. Uh, they're all up in the cloud. So it's really not too much of a difference. Now, granted, the way that we administer it and everything else, that's a big difference. Because remember, Exchange on-premise is designed for one single organization. And we'll, we'll kind of talk a little bit about that, but it's just one exchange organization. Uh, whereas Exchange Online is designed for you know millions of different organizations all kind of working together. So what do we have and how does that work in the back end? Well, like I said, we'll get to that when it comes to uh, the, the mailbox side of things. So Exchange itself, as I said, it does so many things. Let's look at one of the things it could do. Email. Well, obviously, we know that. That's the whole purpose of this discussion here, but that's not all it does. We're talking about calendaring. So again, keeping track of our calendars. I will be 100% honest with you. Um, I live and die by my calendar inside of uh, my Exchange server. I do so many things inside of it that, um, honestly, uh, it keeps track of my day. I need to know where I'm going. But here's the other factor is that this is one piece of this puzzle that we're going to start looking at here is when we start talking about teams, when we look at calendaring, calendaring has a lot of features and functionality that intertwine with teams meetings when we're talking about uh, having virtual meetings and such. So if we're going to be having meetings and such, it has a big calendaring integration into it. This is another one that has integrations, tasks, or planner is another common scenario here. But this is essentially keeping things to do. Uh, hey, I got to do this task by this day and keeping track of it. Now we can start expanding upon that as we get into the productivity suite. Uh, that'll be in our next discussion here around to do and planner and such. Uh, but again, overall, tasks are inside of Exchange now, which is super great. Contacts, this is another big one, especially in that C-suite category. Uh, exchange contacts are so important for our organization, but really around the idea of the C-suite and executive levels, they have 80 billion contacts that they have and they deal with from day-to-day -day basis. What they more importantly are concerned about are the contacts inside of their mailbox. And those mailboxes, or excuse me, those contacts inside of the mailbox are going to be synchronized to different locations. One of which is their good old buddy, which I'm holding it up here right now, is our mobile phones. So this is a huge factor. Active Sync and the way that it works nowadays here, which again, we will get into, uh, how it works is so important for the business world. And this is kind of the nature of the game where we're at nowadays is that uh, email, uh, for the most part nowadays, um, there's two variables really when it comes down to it. I am very much in the, we'll call it the, the more old, older mentality of I am a desktop first kind of person. You know, I, I, just, I just don't work well on a phone. I need to have a desktop. So I use the Outlook thick clients. I use Teams thick clients. I use everything on my desktop. And then 
when I'm traveling or anything, if I need to do little uh, responses here and there, I'll use my phone. But that's not the case for most corporate users nowadays. Most people are mobile first, uh, and that's just the nature of the game now. So when it comes to contacts, they need to synchronize those contacts to their personal phones or whatever phone they currently are running uh, so they can be able to have everybody's numbers as well as their email addresses and all of those things too. Uh, so contacts are very important. We'll talk a little bit more about contacts in the idea of a global address list that's a little bit different these are going to be your personal contacts so you know so and so at uh, you know wherever organization that uh, we've worked and done business with in the past uh, that i have a good relationship with i'm going to keep those as contacts they may not be global where everybody needs to have access these are ones that are going to be personal to you all right with that being said a very high level overview. I'm not going into the nitty gritty of, you know, deep down SMTP, uh, looking at, you know, all of the, the different sections of it. We're going to dive into that a little bit further of exchange in particular of how the architecture works when we're sending, receiving uh, and delivering mail to our databases or wherever it may be. Uh, but at a very high level standpoint, that's about all I really care that, you know, uh, Microsoft Exchange, if this is things that you've already known, you know, great, that's wonderful. Uh, but again, just to make sure everyone's on the same page here, Microsoft Exchange is a productivity platform uh, that allows us to communicate as well. Uh, so again, very important nowadays, very, very big. And you'll start seeing how this is one piece of this overall modern network puzzle. All right, with that being said, that is the it for this, excuse me, that is it for this particular discussion here. We're going to start talking about the different sections of Exchange. And in particular, we're jumping into mail flow and transport. This is a big topic here, and there's a lot of information with it. So we're going to have a lecture and a lab around that one there. So uh, thank you for attending this particular discussion here. We'll see you over on the next one.